Hi, this is Ben with Novolux Stereophonic, and today we're going to take a look at the Sansui 9090. Now, I've come to refer to this model as the 9090 non-DB, simply because there's so much buzz around its successor, the 9090 DB, that I feel I always need to clarify whenever I'm talking about this piece. So I've done a full electronic restoration on this unit as part of a four-part series I'm doing called Which Monster Receiver Should I Restore Next? So this is number two in the series. The first one was the Rotel uh, 1603. In this video, I'm going to be covering some technical info about the unit. We'll take a detailed look at the front and rear panels, um, open it up, take a look at the restoration that was done, and throughout that whole process, I'm going to be comparing um, the 9090 to the 9090DB, just in case anyone's trying to decide which of the two they should get. And uh, then we'll wrap up with some testing at the bench. So if that sounds cool, stick around. Let's start out with some simple technical info on the 9090. So this unit was produced from roughly 1975 to 1977, and it actually overlapped in production with the 9090DB, which was produced from around 76 to 79. The 9090 has a rated output power of 110 watts per channel with less than 0.2% THD, where the 9090DB is rated at 125 watts per channel. All right, let's dive right into a close look at the front panel. Starting in the upper left hand corner here, the signal and the tuning meter are the same between uh, the, the 9090 and the DB, but the way they propagate light is slightly different, I think because of the way that the, um, uh, like the housings around the meter assemblies work. So on the, on the 9090 DB, when I replace these with LED, they always pop with a nice crisp cyan where it's a little bit more subdued and almost towards like an aqua green on the, on the 9090. I did, um, LED for the entire dial and also for all the indicators for stereo and, and sources. I opted to, to do new incandescent lamps instead of LEDs for the power meters. I think this is the best look I've gotten so far on these to, to get a nice bright uh, pop on the meter and the dial, but um, to not change the, the color temperature uh, too much. So this is more of like an original stock look. I'm also still incandescent on the pointer there. While we're on the topic of illumination, Stock on a 9090, when you rotate to aux, uh, a phono, um, or you have a, a tape, you're listening to tape, but you're not on uh, the FM or the AM, it's going to take the dial out. So you're going to lose the, the pointer, the um, signal and tuning meters, and the entire dial when you're on phono or aux. So that's a simple modification to switch that over. I've done that here so that you get the beautiful dial lights regardless of which source you're on. It's a very common modification. On the 9090DB, they did away with that weird switching on and off of the dial and it's on all the time anyways. So they must have caught on to that and changed it in that uh, series. Let's move on to uh, the power switch. So the, the power button itself is the same uh, as all the rest of the buttons on this panel. When you go to the DB series, that's gonna be rectangular with a red dot in it. So that's another quick way to identify a 9090 versus a 9090 DB. We're gonna push this button and when it turns on, this protector is gonna flash at us red. And then when the, the time delay finishes and the relay closes, it'll switch to green. There it is. And if, you, um, if your unit just continues to flash in red, what that usually means is the fusible resistors in the driver card have, have drifted way out of spec and the unit's gonna need service. Let's move on to the rest of the, the controls here. So we've got a low and a high filter. These are just fixed um, EQ filters that help with turntable rumble and noisy recordings and stuff like that. Uh, audio muting is just a negative 20 dB uh, attenuation. So when I push that, we can still hear the audio but it's just much quieter. So that just takes the, the, the uh, output level and drops it by negative 20 dB. This section here is completely different on the dB series um, because there's, that's, all, that's where you get all your functions for uh, the Dolby noise reduction and the meter calibration and stuff. Uh, and they, they also needed room for the, for the Dolby circuit, so they moved the loudness and the mode up here. So this section is completely different on the 99 dB. Um, on the 9090, we have a, an external processor loop for Dolby noise reduction or a four channel adapter. So instead of having the Dolby features built in, you would offload it to another box and you could activate that here. FM muting is for when you're, uh, you have a station that's below the muting threshold. So right now I'm between stations and it's, it's muted it out because the signal's not strong enough. If I turn the FM muting uh, off, it, we're gonna hear noise here. So the, that feature is just, if you've got a station that's too weak for the, the tuner's threshold, you can force it um, to, 
uh, to come in by pushing that button. The MPX noise canceller, as far as I know, is very similar to what's, for, what's referred to as like a stereo blend uh, control. And what it does is when you have a very weak station that's kind of noisy, uh, in stereo, you can push this MPX canceller and it will cancel out the majority of the high frequency noise. And I believe it does that by, by blending some of the, um, the high together, but it's not quite outlined in the manual. I'm going to try to get my mic right next to the speaker so that you can hear this. Everyone from Aretha Franklin to uh, Fonda Ray, from Mary Wells to Amy Winehouse. So that's the MPX noise canceller. The DB does not have that feature. Another feature the DB doesn't have is multipath. So this is actually a great feature for um, uh, setting up your antenna if you've got interference between stations. So as I'm moving that, you'll see that, that we've got um, multipath here. So even though this station is coming in, there's interference from something. Um, if we go to a, a strong local station, stereo there, if I go here, we'll see that the, the multipath is almost nothing. So uh, again, that's a feature that was taken out in the DB to make room for the Tolby circuit. All right, let's take a look at the bottom apron. So starting off with the speaker selector here, this is identical to the 9090 DB, but the way that it functions is different. So right now I only have speakers connected to speaker A. So I've got audio here. If I go down to A plus B and A plus C, I still get sound. If you did that same exact test on the 9090 dB, when you went to A plus C and A plus B, you wouldn't hear anything because on the dB, the speakers are selected in series. On the 9090, they're selected in parallel. This section here is pretty much identical between a 9090 and a 9090 dB. Uh, for tone, the mid-range is always in circuit. For bass, you can select between 300 hertz and 150 hertz for kind of where the, the frequency is affected, and then you can boost and cut here. And same thing with treble, we've got 1.5 kilohertz and 3 kilohertz for our two selections there. And of course, the middle is defeat, which means this control is pretty much out of circuit. It still has a very minor effect, but in essence, when you're in defeat, you're running flat, and the best you can do for mid-range is leave it in the zero position. It's That control is really always in circuit. Um, volume is concentric, so we have volume here, and then balance is on this rear uh, portion here with a detent in the middle, so automatically click into the centered position here. Uh, next up we have loudness and mode, so um, on the DB these two controls are relocated up to push buttons to make room for that Dolby circuit. Uh, loudness basically is a uh, curve that's tied to the volume control that uh, compensates for um, the way that the human ear works at low listening levels. So the application for loudness control is when you're listening at low volume and you feel like it's lacking bass. If you click the loudness, it'll kind of make the bass a little bit more fuller and give you a little bit more treble detail. And that effect tapers off the higher the volume control goes. And when you're around like 40, 50% loudness is basically not, uh, not in effect. A lot of people will use this just to get a little uh, bass boost. It's sometimes a little bit nicer to listen to rather than just you know increasing your bass on the, the EQ over here. Mode just switches between mono and stereo, and you can see it kills the stereo indicator when we go to mono here. This is just our uh, tape monitor section. So on the, the 9090 dB, your tape monitor buttons are located uh, up here, and then this whole section gets reproduced uh, or, or allocated for the Dolby noise reduction circuit. This allows us to select monitoring uh, deck one or two, or uh, dubbing from one deck to another. To finish up the front panel, on the 9090 dB, they reversed these two positions, so your selector is actually here and the mic level is over this way. I think that was just a decision um, based on how the, the rear board was laid out. Um, for the selector itself, we only have one phono input on a 9090. The 9090 dB has phono 1 and phono 2. FM auto um, is just going to allow stereo broadcast to come through when it's available. When we go to Dolby FM, you're going to hear a slight difference. So that puts a, um, a special de-emphasis in for if a station was broadcasting in Dolby FM. That's basically a feature that will never get used. There's really no radio stations anymore that are broadcasting in Dolby FM. So pretty much useless. Uh, we have AM, of course. Let's see if we can find a station here. There's something in here somewhere. And auxiliary, of course. And that's, uh, that's about it for the front panel. So let's uh, spin this around and take a look at the back. 
At first glance, when we compare the back panel of a 9090 to a 9090 dB, they look very similar, but they, they have a lot of little subtle differences. So the first big one is this cage here that covers the output transistor heatsink is not present on a dB. So the screw holes for it are still there because they recycled the chassis for the new model, but it's just, I guess, a little bit of cost cuttings there. When we look at the left-hand section here, they look very similar, but there's been a lot of rearrangement on the DB. So the tape one and two uh, loops have been moved up to this position. And since the Dolby noise reduction was built into a 9090 DB, these four jacks became kind of obsolete. So what they did is they added a Phono 2 and a second pre-out. Now, the, the pre-out is not a huge, uh, huge deal. If you wanted to run like a, a second amplifier or a subwoofer or something on the 9090, you could just run a Y cable out of the pre-out, feed one side of it back into the main in and the other side out to uh, whatever your, your external secondary device is going to be. The Phono, however, that is kind of a loss. So on the, on the DB, you have Phono 1, 2. On the 9090, you can only plug in one turntable at a time. On the right side over here, it's pretty much identical besides one thing. The fuse indication here for when you run it in 220 and 240 volt, it's recommended uh, 5 amp here, where on the, the DB it says 7 amp on the back panel. We have a switched and an unswitched outlet, our speaker A, B, and C, and again on the 9090, these are wired in parallel on the selector. On the, the DB series, if you select A plus B, for example, they, they run in series with one another. Um, just uh, to, to get the proper load impedance for the output section. This plate here can be removed, and behind there, there's a little plug that allows you to select four different world voltages, 100, 120, 220, 240. And if you do switch into the higher range, 220, 240, that's where the, the fuse would get changed. All right, uh, let's uh, take a look inside and see what this thing's all about. The first thing that always strikes me when I'm looking at the inside of a Sansugi XOXO receiver is the giant power transformer. These <laughs> things are just huge. This uh, square card here is the power supply. It also houses uh, some of the output circuits. So this vertical mounted card here is really where the, um, uh, the Sansui 9090 and the 9090DB differ quite significantly. We also have the emitter resistors housed there. And then on the back section here is where the output transistors are located. The card here is um, configured in what's called quasi-complementary. It means that all of the output transistors are the same type. In this case, they're all NPN. Um, and the 9090DB is what's called true complementary, where you have a mix of PNP and NPN transistors, one handling each portion of the waveform. Now, they're both valid topologies. The quasi-complementary is just slightly older. The history is that back in the day, um, the TO3 package big uh, PNP output transistors were not able to be manufactured to the same standard as the NPNs. So a lot of companies made these quasi-complementary circuits. Some famous ones are the very early Macintosh ampli solid state amplifiers, 2505, 2105, 2100, 2300. Those are all pure NPN output stages, quasi-complementary. So there's nothing wrong with that design. It's just an earlier way to do it. So that's the... Uh, that's the vertical driver card. Down here we have the input selector board in the phono stage. And one of the things that makes this a, kind of a better design than the, than the 9090DB is on the connectors coming from the input and output jacks, they're all hardwired connections. It's a jumper cable that goes from, from uh, the connector right into the board. On the 9090DB, it's either a ribbon cable or a thin flexible PCB, and those are, those are known failure points. So this is, that's an area where the 9090 is actually uh, far superior to the 9090DB. Along that same line, this unit is so much easier to service than 9090DB. A lot of techs will just simply not work on 9090 dBs because of the Dolby circuit, and others uh, will just bypass the Dolby circuit entirely, uh, which kills the, the tape monitor functions of the unit. So you're stuck with aux, phono, and tuner only. So you're losing some, some of your additional inputs. Uh, so the, the 9090 is much more serviceable just because it doesn't have those ribbon cable failure points, and it doesn't have the, uh, the Dolby noise reduction circuit to deal with. The whole board up here is the tuner chassis, and this is uh, this section here and the front end are basically identical in a 9090 and 9090 dB, except for this vertical uh, card here, which handles the multipath, which is a feature that was eliminated in the dB series. 
this board also has several different versions. The one that's in the service manual does not ma match this. I guess it depends on the year that it was made. Over here, we have an RF power supply. This just su supplies the regulated voltage for the tuner circuit. In the 9090DB, this section services both the tuner and the Dolby circuit, but it's poorly designed and overheats and, and scorches parts. So usually what I have to do is offload the resistors and put them on a heat sink on, on the back panel here. And it's just a lot of extra work. On the 9090, it's just not necessary. The supply runs, uh, runs fairly cool. If we take this unit off, I'm not going to do this now because this is entirely assembled, but basically this entire tuner chassis can lift out of the unit and then it allows easy service of everything underneath. So I'll throw up some stills as we discuss that. So the protection card is slightly different from model to model. In the 9090, it uses a four pole relay. In the 9090DB, it's a three pole relay. The tone card is basically identical. Um, and uh, I guess some of the other differences are just the, the big Dolby card taking up all the space in there in the DB model. So they are actually very similar when it comes to preamplifier topology. They use this little IC. It's a transistor array called a BA312. And they, um, the, the phono stage and the line stage are basically identical between 9090 and 9090dB. They may be laid out slightly differently, but the circuit operates the same way. So the sonic differences that, that may be heard between those two models are, are likely related to the output stage. I really don't have a preference. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, your own personal opinion uh, which one of these you like the sound of better. If you're trying to make a decision between which one of these units to get, I would encourage you to make this decision based on a, on a few key um, categories. So first off is, do you ever see yourself using two turntables simultaneously? If that's the case, you definitely want to go with the 9090DB since the 9090 only has one phono input on the back. Another factor to consider is FM tuner features. So if you like listening to radio, the 9090 has, has more tuner features. You have that, um, that MPX noise canceller and the uh, multipath uh, metering. So, so actually more features in the tuner of the 9090 than the 9090DB. Um, and then the final one is serviceability. If you have a local technician that is qualified to service a 9090 dB and they're willing to do it, um, it's going to make you more comfortable getting one. If you, you don't have a local tech that you trust, you're going to be safer, especially buying some, a used unit on eBay, to get a 9090. You're going to have an easier time finding a technician to work on this one than you are working on the 9090 dB. Uh, factors that I would not consider would be the Dolby noise reduction feature. It's, it, it seems like what happened with this is the 9090 was a pretty darn good design. They did have to upgrade some stuff with some service bulletins, which are really well documented. That's related to some, some pigtail fuses that need to get added on this board. Um, some fuses got increased in value, certain things like that. Um, but overall, it's a very stable design. It seems like the DB was just there to add a bunch of features that were, that were pushed by marketing. And Dolby FM is useless now, and making your own Dolby Eyes tapes is really not um, really a big thing unless you have a tape deck that doesn't have built-in uh, noise reduction. So I would not consider the Dolby noise reduction part as as a reason to to get or to not get 9090 dB. Um, I really wouldn't consider the output stage just because these are so similar in their output power. It's a, it's a different topology. If there is a sonic difference, it would probably come here. But again, I think the features of the tuner and the phono stage are probably your biggest deciding factors. Um, all right, let's uh, um, take a look at kind of all the parts I replaced in this thing and why I did that, and then we'll move on to the bench test. All right, let's take a look at everything that I, that I pulled out of this thing. I've gotten in the habit lately of... Um, of assembling part kit, parts kits before I start a restoration just to speed up the process. And it also allows me to put all the parts that I, that I pull out of the unit into these little baggies so I can see what came out of where. So on this one, I did not do a lot of component testing um, because uh, it was mostly working aside from the driver card. Once I, once I repaired the driver card, this thing was fully operational. So there wasn't a lot of obviously bad parts in it. This was more of a, um, a, a restoration to keep this thing running properly for the long term. So I'm going to go over kind of everything that's here and give you an idea of what needs to get replaced in these and what's really optional. So let's uh, let's start out with some simple stuff. Main filter capacitors. So 
these are rated at 6,800 microfarad, which is kind of small. Um, I was able to get a 10,000 microfarad cap that was the same diameter, Nichicon uh, Gold Tune. I didn't buy that cap because it was audio grade. It just had the, the proper terminals. I've done this with screw terminal caps before and it really just doesn't work out. It's better to have lugs like this on the replacement caps. So that was an upgrade from 6,800 to 10,000 microfarad. These caps were actually okay to stay in, um, but we upgraded them because we were in there. Uh, for the driver card, this is the most important important section. And what happened here was it's basically these fusible resistors that go bad. These all drift, and once they drift too far, the circuit can't operate properly, and the protection won't work. So these are the you know an example of some of the fusible resistors that needed to get pulled out and replaced in that vertical driver card. Um, I did a, a couple Zener diodes. These capacitors, I'm guessing all these blue ones would test fine. The ones to watch out for here are, um, are these orange Nichicons. These are gonna, these lower value, uh, low leakage caps usually develop high ESR. Uh, these ones were replaced just because I put an audio grade cap in their place, not a big deal. Trimmer pots can often be salvaged, uh, but I, I opted to put in new trimmers and I, uh, while I was in there for longevity. The transistor replacements are all preventative. These differential input pairs um, are okay. They're not like a black leg transistor, but these 2SC 1400s are known to fail from time to time and cause issues. These were replaced with uh, matched pairs, which helps the, uh, um, the DC offset be stable. And I also, you'll see this little green heat shrink. I thermally coupled those together. This again, these transistors are all working. It's just preventative maintenance. These little glass diodes are also replaced as they can be a, a failure point in the future. So the driver card's really the, the fusible resistors that cause the most issues. Um, capacitors, not so much. A lot of this was preventative. And like I said, once I, once I got that driver card resolved, the unit was basically functional. So the rest is just kind of maintenance. So we'll look at these, these baggies here in a little bit less detail because it's not, uh, it's not as important. Let's start with the protection. So. With the protection, there was a couple of fusible resistors in there. I replaced the, the relay for good measure. This one wasn't extremely pitted. I might save this relay and use it for a different project, but I put a brand new one in there. These, um, some of these lower value caps may start to drift, but these bigger ones will usually be just fine. So a lot of times you can get away with base, just basic maintenance on here. Um, power supply, I did test these caps. All these caps and transistors were good. Um, just replaced them because we were in there. Let's see, tuner. Th this is a place where it's um, where you can get some some components that are really drifting badly. So, here these dark orange caps, the light orange caps, those are starting to go high ESR. Uh, I had a couple carbon comp composition resistors. This is a lot of carbon comp resistors. In the output section of the tuner, if these drift too badly, you'll get really bad channel imbalance in the tuner. So I had to replace some resistors in there. Tantalum capacitor. So the the tuner functioned fine with all this stuff in there, but uh, um, when I'm doing a realignment, I like to have all fresh parts in there, align it with good parts that aren't going to drift, you know, um, in the in the coming years. So the tuner, I do like to do a full uh, recap on for that reason. Um, what were these from? This is probably just from some miscellaneous filter boards. And again, in these bags, the ones that tend to drift are the are the little orange ones. Anything that's lower value. Uh, these are just some of the lamps that I replaced. Phono board, same thing. Some of these low leakage orange caps. This RF power supply was completely fine. I just replaced that because these these past transistors do uh, dissipate a lot of heat over time. So that was just, again, preventative maintenance on the RF power supply. And uh, Tone Circuit had some black leg transistors. These tested fine, but these are a known troublemaker, I think. That's gonna be... Yeah, 2SC 1313. I've had these cause issues on Pioneers before. Uh, this black leg, so some of that stuff needs to go. Um, yeah, but overall, uh, it was basically just a preventative maintenance rebuild just to get this thing extremely stable um, and aligned. So, all right, let's move on to the power test. Okay, the 9090 is up at the bench. Um, just go over some connections quick. So I've got speaker A connected to an 8 ohm dummy load. This is monitored across the oscilloscope and my Panasonic distortion analyzer. The low distortion oscillator of this Panasonic is going to the auxiliary in on the 9090, and then I'm adjusting the overall volume with the actual volume control on the unit. So we're going through the entire 
um, preamp stage, output stage, so we're seeing a little bit of everything here as far as performance goes. We're not just testing the power amp, this is going through the whole unit. So what I'm going to do is turn on the oscillator, and then I'm going to start bringing up the volume. We stop there at about 10 watts. Just want to show you this on the oscilloscope. So basically, what can happen with carbon controls is we can get a little bit of channel deviation. So right now you can see that the blue and the yellow waveform, which represent left and right channel, are not directly overlapped on top of each other. As I rotate the control down, you can see that they converge. And they kind of, you know, they will converge at different points depending on, on which way I'm rotating the control. So this is just the nature of carbon controls. Uh, a dual pot is not linear throughout its entire range, usually, unless it's a very high-end control. So this is just common in these XOXO receivers. This is not enough of a dB variation for you to pick up an image shift on it, but it is there. So for this power test, uh, what I'm going to do is get the waveforms equal or into an equal spot here. And then we will ramp the signal up with the oscillator. So I'm just going to slightly change the balance control to get these waveforms to overlap. Somewhere right about there. Okay, let's go over to, I'll just zoom this out so we can see the scope and the distortion analyzer at the same time. And we're going to ramp this up to clipping power. So we're going to see where this actually clips. So it's rated at 110 watts, but usually these vintage amplifiers will test well above uh, their rated power. So I'm on amplitude and I'm just going to ramp this up until we clip. About 50 watts. It's almost 100 watts. Let's change this here. Looks like I'm just a little bit off. That's really close there. Okay, let's start ramping this until we clip. There's clipping there. And there I'm clean. So about 130 watts is the true clipping power of the 9090. And you can see the distortion here is about 0.06%. As I back this down and go to rated power, we'll see the distortion drop quite a bit. So let's find 110 watts right around there. You can see on one channel I'm at 0.04% and this is 0.03%. You know, 37, right around 0.04%. And the rated distortion is 0.2%. So this is exceeding it by a long shot. Um, this is at one kilohertz. Let's take it to 20 kilohertz and see how it does in the higher band. See, so we got a bit of an amplitude drop. It's just the, the linearity is not perfect in this analyzer. Get back to 110, about 0 0.07, 0 0.06. And then let's take it to the under, other end. We'll go to 20 hertz. Just ramping this back up to 110 or so. Right around there. And you see again 0 0.035, let's say, around 0.04%. So overall, uh, a great performer. These units sound fantastic. They, they're not rated as, uh, as low distortion as other models from this era, but they just really, really sound good. So again, that is the Sansui 9090. Thanks again for stopping by the channel. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming to watch this content. And if you like these videos, I encourage you to subscribe and come back for more. We'll see you on the next one.